Really? Hey, I get, at least I get to start with a laugh, right? Not a bad thing. How's everybody doing? Yeah? That's it? We're still tired after lunch? How about Ryan Holiday, though, huh? Pretty good. Has anybody read his work? A couple people. I know you have, Elias. Uh, I was, oh, yeah, I see you, Steve. Uh, I think Jason was the first one to recommend a book, so I'm right there with some of y'all. Um, and then it goes through a couple other friends and then comes back to me. I read his trilogy, and it's fantastic. And that's why I asked him that question. It's like, okay, I see the obstacle. I can change my mindset. But then I, I kind of fall back into where I was looking at the obstacle with emotion. And so we are actually going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, kind of an interesting topic if you think about it. Please, sir, I want some more. Um, I'm going to bring you something a little different. Um, I'm not a dentist. I'm not a physician. Uh, but like Jason said, I, I do this because of people. And I think this doesn't work unless you work on yourselves, number one. But number two, work with your team and then work through your patient. Because as people, we want to be talked to. We want to be understood. We want to be connected with, right? And so at any rate, I hope you get a little something out of this today. And if I can impact one person over here and one person over there, I will be incredibly happy because it's really hard to stand on a stage uh, where Aaron Elliott was just at and... uh, Ryan Holiday, and everybody else. Uh, but before I dig in, happy Valentine's Day. Is anybody here with their loved ones? A couple of you? Uh, mine was supposed to come this year, and she couldn't. Um, but she was pretty excited that the Costco flowers landed on time. I just got the text, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, Jason said it all, so I don't need to go too far into this, and this is what embarrasses me most. Uh, bottom line, I am biased. Yes, I am one of the co-founders of sleeptest.com. Yes, I'm the president and CEO. And I do that because I love people. And I, what I'm sharing today is biased in a way that I want to impact the way you guys look at your people or your patients as people. Because we can't go straight to the appliance that we love, whether it's from Whole U or Prosomnus or Glidewell, you name it, until we're actually having a committed conversation with a patient who actually embraces what you're saying. And so even though most of my career has been in healthcare, the one thing I'm most proud of that's on this slide is my family. Um, everyone does this, so you got to do it. I'm a real person too. Um, so at any rate, see if this guy works. My wife, Selena, our twins, Micah and Skyla, I got that picture yesterday as they were dressed up for Valentine's Day. Um, and no, we're not from Houston, but I coach t-ball and soccer, and that was our, don't get mad at me, my SoCal friends. But uh, there's a lot more motivation behind this, and I hope you guys know what that motivation is for yourselves. Uh, this is me, so if you haven't heard me speak before, Um, I'm a walking, talking apneic patient. I may not look like one on the outside, but on the inside, it's clear, thanks to our friends at Vatek who pointed this out to me. And this is the one thing, again, I'll say, you don't have to have CBC to do sleep, but it sure as heck helps when you're trying to educate a patient so they can see this. I'm pointing here as if you can see. So look, I'm in this journey with you. If I don't wear my appliance every night, my wife will kill me in number, number one. Um, and I get that nudge, hey, put your appliance in your snoring. I'm like, oh, thanks, babe. Reach over, put it in, because I prefer to kiss her before I put it in, and then I fall asleep. Um, but I also don't have the energy to spend the time with my children, playing soccer in the backyard after school, riding bikes, etc. So I'm in it. And it wasn't until I sort of went along this journey to understand where uh, this has traumatized my own father's life. And so forgive me for those of you guys who have heard me speak before, but this is, we're going to be talking about motivation. And so if you don't know what your motivation is and your team doesn't know what that is and therefore your patients don't know what it is, then you're in trouble. And so my dad is the one reason why I got into sleep medicine five, six years ago. Um, Open heart surgery at 55 years old. Um, The day after I got my wisdom teeth pulled, by the way, at 17 years old, driving your dad to the hospital on Vicodin. Um, Probably not a good idea, but when your dad's having severe chest pains, it's time to do something about it. Um, After that... Multiple angioplasties, keeping the vessels open, both veins and arteries after that, four stents placed. And it wasn't until after all four stents were placed that his car- uh, cardiologist at Kaiser Hospital in Southern California said, you know, we should probably check your sleep out. Do you sleep well? Do you snore? Yeah. I remember playing soccer in the street out front in the cul sac okay? cul sac driveway, home, kitchen. If I could go any further, I'm going to break something. Couch. I could hear my dad snoring on the couch. And so... About 13 months ago, he had a stroke. 
Um, he's been on CPAP for years. We love it. We love all forms of therapy. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's changed him um, dramatically and changed my relationship with him in the good because, like Ryan said, the obstacle is the way, right? It gave me an opportunity to spend more time with my dad, figure out what's going on, build that relationship that I didn't have when I was 20 or 30 years old. Um, and believe it or not, at 76 years old, he's back to work. He loves nothing more than hanging out with us as a family. Um, so he's still moving around, even after all this has gone on, but he would be a different person if he didn't go through this, if his dentist, if his physician, if somebody would have brought this to his, his attention a long time ago. So again, find your story, whatever it might be, share it with your patients, help them understand it, and I promise you'll, you'll really find a way into their heart, and I'm going to take you from their mind into their heart today, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So First and foremost, we're going to do this without manipulation, okay? I'm just going to teach you some tools and some tactics with regards to how to get your patient to ask you for therapy, for a sleep test, for education, for awareness. Um, from there, we want to really start with you again with regards to self-awareness, something I've been studying for the last two years, and I think we can have some fun with it. Beyond that, we want to think about what your patients crave, and I'm not talking about what they want, what they need. I'm talking about what do they crave? And in the meantime, I want you guys to think about what is, what is something you crave? Is it chocolate? Is it sitting on the beach later today? Whatever it might be, but craving's a little bit different than just a want or a need, okay? Uh, last but not least, I want to step into something called motivational interviewing. Has anybody ever studied motivational interviewing? Okay. I have physically been kind of in this space for a little bit, and I've been talking to a number of people, all of my clinicians in life right now, dentists, uh, a surgeon, recently had rotator cuff surgery, um, my physical therapist, and my family physician. The only one in that entire group that has studied motivational interviewing was my physical therapist. And they have to, because they have to motivate me. Just getting my arm to here, I'll tell you, I have cried three times in the last two months in, in physical therapy because of what it takes, and I'll show you, this is about as far as I can get on my own, um, but I planned the surgery perfectly so I'd be ready for you guys today. So if we have enough time, I have a small favor. If we have enough time and you like what I've heard, or you've heard from me, excuse me, um, I'd invite you to just do a little something for me at the very end, okay? Um, let's do this. So self-awareness. You guys might be wondering, why the heck is this guy talking about self-awareness? What does this have to do with my dental practice? Gents, you tell me if I move too far. I like to move around. It's a small stage. Um, self-awareness. Anybody taking some time to think about self-awareness? What does it mean? Was it due for you other than you? Yes, a little bit. So why are we talking about this today? So we're going to start with you. We're going to go into your practice, and then we're going to talk about your patients. Because again, like Jason said, it starts with people, not just patients. So I'm going to ask you to do some things, and you have to be somewhat involved. Otherwise, this is all going to be super boring. So you with me? All right. So everybody in the crowd, answer these questions for me just by raising your hand. How many of you think you're great leaders? That's it? Yeah, yeah, yeah? Okay, yeah. Okay, how many of you guys think you're a great friend? Hope that one goes up a little bit higher. Okay, last but not least, be honest, how many of you think you're a great driver? I know half y'all are lying. I'm gonna, I know you're, you're all lying. Now here's what I want you to do. Those of you guys who are with your spouse today, are they being honest? Are they being real? I want to look at your face and see. Okay, so let's, let's try this again. Okay, who raised their hand for just one? Just one of those three. Okay. Who raised their hand for two of them? Okay. It's okay. You guys can actually put your hands up. Okay. Happy hour's coming later, but you have to get through me first, and we all want to see Jameson Spencer. Okay. Who raised their hand for all three? I would. And look at your neighbor again. Were they lying? <laughs> Probably, right? All right, here's something we got to realize, and that I did not know. And this is on behalf of the work of Dr. Tasha Urich. If you want more information about it, come find me later. Self-awareness is not just understanding who we are. I do that fantastic. But it's also how we're seen. And neither one of them, there's no correlation between the two, but the key word here is and, and I fail with the second one, I can tell you that right now. 
And your neighbor sitting next to you is probably thinking the same thing. But look at this. Self-aware people, more productive, happier, more confident. We all want that, right? No, okay. I do. I do. That would feel great. So how many of you guys feel like you're self-aware? Cool. That actually goes right along with the stats. Uh, I would raise my hand if I were you. I would have raised, raised my hand for all three of those items. Uh, but here's the sad part. First and foremost... 50% of us think that we're above average. 95% of people think that they're self-aware. And that wasn't everybody in here. Uh, but here's the honest truth. Only about 10 to 15% of people are, in fact, self-aware. And so I challenge you to think about that and what that looks like for you in your practice. Um, this all starts with clarity. Um, some of my friends in the back have read some books on uh, clarity with uh, Brendan Burchard that I think is fantastic. But Clarity is, who am I, what do I want, and how am I going to get there? If you don't know those things, then it's a challenge. And I, too, have been talking about our why, our purpose, for a long time. Thank God for Simon Sinek, or Sinek, however you want to put it. Fantastic work. But here's the deal. A lot of us know what our why and our purpose is. Now I'm going to challenge you to think outside of that. Does everybody, do you guys have a good idea of what your why is? Give me some hand raising again. Why you're a dentist, why you became a dentist, why you got into dental sleep medicine, why you started a company. Joey, why you keep coming with me? Uh, but the not wise, this is the challenging part where you got to dig deep. The not wise are the fear of failure, the fear, fear of loss. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, can I sleep test patients? My team won't do this. It's too uncomfortable. Man, cash flow's tight. I can't buy that CBCT or even set up with a new sleep test company. Or I can't sleep. So think about what those not wise. Does anybody have a, a, I'm calling them not wise. Okay, does anybody have a, a not why or 10 in their life like I do? Something holding you back? Um, only us? Wow, it's just me and you, sir. Wow, you guys are amazing. Whoa, whatever you guys are drinking, I'd like some. Uh, here, here's what I want you to do, a small exercise, and I would challenge you guys to do a couple things. I'll, I'll talk about it throughout the time, but challenge you guys to do this with your team as well. Um, it might happen to be a huge long list, um, but what I would recommend, you can write all over my handout, tear it up, throw it in the trash, but I want you to write down just one simple thing that you might consider a not why, something that's holding you back from being the best dentist you can be, the best husband you can be, wife, spouse, boyfriend, girlfriend, best leader you can be. I did not see a lot of hands go up uh, when I did ask about who was a great leader. And that's okay. And I appreciate the fact that you guys realize that, but I would also encourage you to take that next step. So rip out just one piece of paper. Smallest piece you got, biggest piece you bought, got, I don't care. But on your way out of here, you write down that one, not why. <laughs> on the way out of here, I want you to look at it, stare it in the face, and throw it in the trash. And if you are here with your spouse because you're here for Valentine's Day, I think it'd be pretty cool to share with them too. Uh, and, and don't stop there, guys. We've got to take out the trash all the time. i got a lot of trash going on up here that I need to get rid of and clear out on a regular basis. And I'll continue to roll myself under the bus while I'm up here. I think it's important that we be real, we be vulnerable. I think the most courageous thing that Dr. Umbrella could have done was to call herself out and, and, and jump off stage. I thought that was actually quite phenomenal. It didn't phase her one bit. And so we need to kind of step into this space of self-awareness, but also vulnerability and courage that you may have heard me speak about before. And so, you know, when we talk about self-awareness, it's really what is meaningful to you? And I'd ask you, this is the same thing, write it down. What's meaningful for you? Do you know? What's meaningful to your patients? When was the last time you checked in with them? What's meaningful to your spouse? What are their dreams? Or is it all about us? And ego, which Ryan would say is the enemy. And I'm not speaking in third person, sorry. Ryan Holiday. Um, but I also say, who's lying? We often lie to ourselves about what we're doing well or what we think we understand and what we know. Again, this might get a little weird for some of you guys. It's okay. And I, you would not offend me if you got up and, and left or jumped on your cell phone. But I think this is important to understand who you are, who your practice is, and then move into your patients, because like Jason said it better than I could have, and I'm giving the lecture, 
It's all about people. And just thinking is not knowing. You can't stop there. Okay? Thinking about it is not knowing. And it is a full choice. It is a full commitment. Whether you're Neo or not. You're probably wondering why that was the first slide in the beginning, huh? It's a choice. Uh, we had a choice to get up this morning. You had a choice to fly here today. You had a choice to bring your team here today, this weekend, spend the money, spend the time, so on and so forth. But it, it is actually a choice to become self-aware, and it's quite challenging. It's a journey. And uh, I'll tell you, self-aware dentists, self-aware anybody, they think differently. They speak differently. They execute differently. What I think is most important here is you influence your own opportunities you influence your environment, you influence your patients, and it all comes from a place of clarity. Has anybody done any other work on this sort of thing? And I, I'm going to do it anyways. Does anybody in here have a business coach, executive coach, life coach, whatever you want to call it? This is more than last year. Good for you guys. I have one. Todd, we've got one. He's the bomb. Yeah, Todd and I share the same business coach. He's amazing. Um, but, but this is a journey, and, and, and to get here, I think it, it does take some tact. And I'll, I'll tell you, speaking from that place of vulnerability and, and uh, I'll call it courage, if you will, um, I, I have a confession. I am not self-aware at all. Um, I study this stuff like crazy. I think I know what it's all about, but uh, just share with you uh, kind of a challenging story without crying. Um, about just a couple months ago, uh, I mentioned him earlier. If you haven't met Mr. Joey Yaller, he's our director at sleeptest.com. Happens to be one of my best friends. Um, I could leave my business with Joey. I could leave my children with Joey. Not that I do. Don't pay him for that. Um, but we have a certain trust that goes a long ways. And we're, we, we practice something called radical transparency and radical open-mindedness. And they don't work unless you both have each of those items. So if he comes at me with radical transparency and I'm not radically open-minded, I'm guarded, I cannot have a hardcore, to-the-heart conversation with him whatsoever. But he came into my office one day, and I, it's only happened a few times, but I can see it on his face, and, and then he closes the door behind him. I'm like, oh, God, you know we have an open-door policy here, Joey. I like to keep that open. He's like, yeah, man, we got to talk. We're frustrated. We're overwhelmed. We're overworked. Um... You know, I know you don't try to. You always have good intentions. But, Ryan, we can't keep up with you, man. You wake up at 5 a.m. You're in the gym at 6. Well, guess what? We're your, we get your first emails in the morning before we even wake up and we get to the office. And guess what? You're at the office later than everybody else. And guess what? By the time I get to the office, not only do I have your evening emails, but I've got your morning emails. And then I've got these action items with to-do lists and the due date and everything else and the calendar invite. And it feels like micromanaging. But it, I didn't think so, because I only saw me. I operate at a high speed. I operate really fast, and that's normal to me. Everything's on a calendar. Everything's on an agenda. But it was frustrating the team. And uh, it was a gut check, not going to lie. I'm an emotional guy, a little teary-eyed. <laughs> like, I try to give my team autonomy. I try to respect who they are. And I didn't realize that just my personal presence of moving in a certain way and that energy caused anxiety around what they were doing. But one thing that Joey and I practice is being loving critics. And you can have this in a professional setting. Yes, we are from California, so maybe we do it more than y'all. But uh, having a loving critic in your life, whether it's a spouse, a brother, sister, uh, someone from your church, an accountability partner, a vendor partner, like my friend Randy Kern over there puts me in check very, quite often, um, allows him to be totally transparent with me and put me in check when I'm in the wrong, even if it sucks when he tells me. And so what I would challenge you guys to do, again, write down two or three people in your practice who you think could qualify, if that's even a potential of being your professional loving critic, but then think about that at home, too. What does that look like? Are you willing to take advice from your, your spouse at home? Do you share your business with your spouse at home? Um, do you have a teammate like these two boys do? Kyle and Joseph can lean on each other left and right. 
Um, it's important. And, and what we learned together as a team, we learned to think about what, not why. And think about this for a second. What, not why. When I think about what, not why, because when Joey came in my office that day, I'm like, why did I let this happen? Why is he saying this? And I started going back into my past of reflection of why am I not doing a good job? Why, why do they feel this way? But that takes us in the past. It takes us backward. And I'm all for reflection, right? But if we meditate in reflection in the negativity, in the why, why, why in the past, it does nothing for us in the future. And so what we focus on now is what can I do better in the future to be a better leader? What can I do to minimize that feeling of micromanagement and give you more autonomy? What can I do to be a better leader? Whatever it might be, but it's what, not why. You with me? I haven't lost anybody yet. Again, you will not hurt my feelings if this gets weird and you need to walk out. It's the last time I'll say it. So now let's talk about your practice, okay? I see the stats all day long, friends. Um, I love what Erin was sharing earlier today, that triangle that she talks about awareness and breaking it all the way down to financials and closing, closing the case. Um, I, I, we look at this as far as not only from a, a trend perspective, but also a human behavior perspective. And this is, these are real practices who utilize our service. And if you think about it, so I've got total patients referred, pending patients, total patient opportunity at 7, 77, completed HSTs at 40, declined testing, 17 out of those 77, no contacts, 20. So I'm operating at 51.95% off of just referring the patient in and getting on a phone call with one of our team members 48 hours later. Would you guys be proud of that? I won't share, but this practice is in the room. It's okay. Check this out. Get on the phone with Doc. Hey, Doc, this isn't working. Here are your numbers. Here's what's going on. We can help. We're involved from a place of purpose. We want to see you do better. We want to see you do well. And, you know, we tag in with one of our trainers, um, producing some videos. Thank you. Dr. Harrison, for appreciating those, um, doing whatever we can to be a partner because these are people, and we don't even make money on when you guys put appliances in, but it's our purpose to get these people in therapy to tackle the epidemic, right? So we're all on the same team, but it's amazing how doctors get mad at us, our team members. This isn't working. That's not working. It's like, doc, build that awareness, turn it into education, build the urgency, and get the patient to move forward. And oh, I didn't really say it, but look, they changed to 87% conversion. And that's good from a dental practice from what we see. And so, again, it took a step back. It took putting the ego in the pocket and thinking about this from an accountability perspective. And we started to talk about well, where do we start with these patients? What do they crave? It's not what do they need. It's not what do they want. It's what do they physically crave from you? Because uh, with all due respect, as we move through business, one year, two year, three years, 15, 20 years, we kind of forget, and it becomes monotonous, and we can't forget what Gandhi says here. The customer is the most important visitor on our premises. We are dependent on him or her. He is the purpose. He's doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to serve. I need to say that part again. He or she is, I, it's he, because that's how I copied and pasted it, but he or she is doing us a favor by giving us an opportunity to serve. But I think a lot of times, whether it's me or a lot of us in here, is like, I have the best dental practice around. People should be so thankful that they get to come to my office. We do Invisalign. We do implants. I've got a CBCT scanner, and I do more sleep than anybody in the area. And we take these things for granted. And I do too. So when we think about Crave, again, it, it's more than just this need, it's just this want. It's, you really have to dive into the patient's psyche to understand what is it that they're begging for, what is it that they're pleading for. And until we know that about your patients, we're not going to get anywhere. And what most of them are looking for is a great deal, right? But they want value, and they're willing to pay more for great value. I do it in my dental practice all the time. Not cheap, but I've known them for 15 years. But look at this. 70% of Americans are willing to spend, spend more money with companies that believe 
to provide, so they believe they provide excellent customer experience. And on top of that, your biggest risk is damaging those relationships. So do you track how many patients you lose? No, probably not. Do you track how many patients you get on a regular basis? Absolutely, I'm sure you do. So we want to hang out in that value space where we bring great value at a lower cost, but as we get fantastic and build these positive experiences, well, then we can increase the cost of what we're doing, each visit, each consult, the clinical exam, the delivery of your appliances, while still staying ethical and fair. So as we look at this specifically, and you think about these folks here, uh, you know all of them, right? If you've been to California, you've had an In-N-Out burger. Okay, Starbucks, you know what you're going to get. Costco, one of my favorite places to shop. I had to stop going in there because I'd go to up and down every aisle. And that gets ugly. But In-N-Out actually has a protocol where they, from start to finish, the patient or the person, the customer's experience starts from a mile away. They actually do this on purpose. They blow the smoke or the, just the vents out from inside so you can smell the burgers from a mile away. You walk in, you're in and out. I mean, legit, you are in and out because there's only four items you can order, but it's really cool because they have secret items too. And if you know the secret items that I don't even know about, I live in California. I'm like, I can get an animal burger, but how do I get it this other way? But one thing these folks all have in common, they provide phenomenal customer experiences, but they create loyal and returning customers. And just some stats, and again, if you guys want to come up afterwards, I'm happy to share with you all the resources I have where I found this data. Um, I have to study this for my own business, right? And the thing is, loyal patients are worth 10 times more than their first purchase. So would you rather be selling, yes, I said selling, to a patient in your chair who's been with you for 10 years or the one who just came in a week ago? The stats say it's easier to sell the patient who's been your friend for a long time. So think about that because I don't know about you, but does anybody in here ever had a patient tattoo your logo on their body? <laughs> yeah, I was just studying this online. Sierra Nevada has a full-blown like following and every year they have this annual event where they all get together and everyone's sharing tattoos. So how do you turn your patients into loyal fans? How do you do it? So again, I don't expect you to have that tattoo anytime soon. Um, but it's all about creating an ecosystem and that was, that's between your patients and, and your team. Okay, that, that ecosystem specifically will, number one, get your patients to stay longer, but number two, a much better work life for your team, increased attendance, and overall, at the end of the day, higher profits. So it's all about figuring that out. And I, I think if you guys were to imagine walking into somebody else's dental office, because I know this is not your dental office, right? But imagine they walk in somebody's office. You walk into another dental office, somebody walks into yours. Uh, no greeting at the front door. Um, this is my first time in your office. Smells a little funny. Okay, I'm already scared, as we talked about from, a, I heard in a couple other lectures, I'm already scared because I'm afraid of the dentist, drill and fill. Okay, and then I walk up to the front desk, the front team is arguing, and, and no lie, this happened at one PT office that I was going to go to, I left right away, I was like, I'm never going back there again, found another one, I was like, oh, breath of fresh air. But then I get to this chunk of paperwork that I've got to sit down in the lobby and physically go through and understand how to fill it out. And the last thing I want to do is paperwork. I want to meet the doctor. Who, where's the doctor? Is he back there? Is she back there? What's, who, who's going to clean my teeth today? Okay, but no, I walk to the back office, and I'm already scared. And I meet Sally. I hear drilling and filling. And God bless my dentists. They're amazing. They do a lot of early work, early adolescent work. Um, I, I think it's fantastic. But you can physically hear some kids kind of yelling and screaming in the back. Um, I'm okay with it, but I, I brought it to their attention, like, hey, you want to like, maybe move them down so uh, some people don't freak out. But if we're here and I'm trying to understand how to be comfortable in your practice when I already have anxiety, how does that work? What is that patient experience like? I want you guys to, to think about it for a moment. What is it like for your new patient that walks in your door? Do you love it? 
Is it fantastic? Did you collaborate with your team on how to create that positive patient experience? Or it was just your own thing that you came up with and ah, this is cool. Um, I'm a big fan uh, that more brains together are stronger than others. And so in really taking the next step to provide pa exceptional patient experience, it's not customer service anymore, people. We talk about customer service all the time. It's about the customer or patient's experience because we should be serving from a place of purpose anyways because we already, most of us already knew our why. Maybe we don't know our not whys. But in order to get that smile in your practice, Grant, she's a model, I know, and whatever, Adobe stock, thank God for them. Um, it's all about the customer experience and no longer about the customer service. And so what I'd like to do is help you understand that you have to have ESP to get this done. Anybody have the third eye here? Are you working toward it? ESP, you know what it stands for? Something a little bit different here. But you got to have it, otherwise it doesn't work. So, expectation, sensory, and the price value comparison, or collaboration. So ESP, that's a good one to write down. So what are your your expectations of your patients, but also what, what is the expectation of the patient who's walking in your door right now? Are you meeting, are, are you even meeting their expectation? Okay, that's great, you, you can also do better. You can exceed their expectation. Sensory, going back to in and out What do I feel, what do I touch, what do I smell when I walk into your dental office? So I legitimately want you to go back to your dental office on Monday and walk in like a new patient and have your entire team treat you like a new patient. Has anybody ever done that in the last year? One. Anybody else? Two. Three. Well, now we're just being shy, or somebody else did it, so I'm going to do it too. So four out of, how many people do we have in the room, Jason? Jason's like, I'm not listening to his lecture. <laughs> so be the experience. Be the experience, figure it out, work with your team, and you've got to map out the patient's journey. Okay, so there are a couple different touch points is what I would call them. Um, this isn't you physically, you know, reaching out and touching the patient, okay? Pre-touch. The pre-touch is what do you look like online? How do you feel online? Uh, I love sending folks over to Mark Fowler and his team over at Bullseye Media because he sets, up, sets you up with a different presence online to showcase who you are as either a dental or dental sleep practice, um, what does that look like? Because that's what everyone's doing. They're already shopping you online before they walk in your door. They've already seen three other practices. They're looking at their, your Yelp reviews, your testimonials. Do you have video? And then it's the first touch. We spoke about that before. Am I welcomed by your team? Am I offered a, maybe a bottle of water? Don't have to, but maybe a bottle of water, perhaps a coffee. Sit down in our comfortable lobby. Um, maybe I'm using a tablet instead of a large stack of paperwork. The core touch is all you, doctor. You are the core touch, along with your assistant and your hygienist, but you are the core touch. While that patient's sitting in your chair, what do you know about them? Do you know their dog's name? Their husband's name? Spouse's name? When was the kid's last soccer game? And what is that experience and that interaction like? And then from there, as they walk out that door, what is that last touch? And then finally, the in-touch piece can either make or break you. In-touch is those email drips that you all send out. The one way to kill your business and your relationship with your patient is that first or second email within six months is selling them something. I'm going to sell you whitening. Hey, we've got a discount on Invisalign. Come in for this. Come in for that. It's the number one way to kill that relationship. But you could be a great trusted advisor. These patients don't know what an airway is. They're not bleeding. They're not in pain. So why do they need your help? So why not send them education, something of value, so that way when they come back in your office, they're asking you about it without you having to even bring it up. I love a lot of folks out here are, are sending out the new ADA statement about why the dentists are now encouraged and almost enforced to be screening for sleep-related breathing disorder. And if they haven't heard that or seen that in 
an email or a piece of mail, they're looking at you like you're crazy if you only do sleep 5 to 10% of the time in your practice. So what I would do if I were you, and I'm not, I would write these down, and once a week I would have a team meeting or once a month, and I would decipher one at a time with your team, collaboration, co-creation. If they're not involved in it, they won't care. They're just doing what you told them to do. So go through the process. Once a week, have a meeting. Team, what is our pre-touch? What does it look like? What's our first touch like? Let's walk through it. Treat me like a patient. And each week, hash through it and redesign that customer experience, that patient experience, so you know what's going on. All right, we're moving on to patients. Everybody still with me? Change or die. It's a good one, huh? All right, from the research and the data, what do you think it is as far as uh, patients in some kind of life-threatening disease? Would they rather change or die? Raise your hand if you think it's change. Okay, what about die? It's kind of even, or otherwise I just don't know what the rest of you guys are doing. Are you scared? All right, the odds are against us, people. Nine to one in some research, and I will, again, email anybody who shoots me an email for this stuff. Patients would rather die than change. It's hard to change bad habits. Smokers, yeah, absolutely. 80% of healthcare costs are consumed by behavioral changes. But yet we are trying to sell an appliance or get a patient to do a sleep test. Gosh. So th this all starts with behavioral change, and it's not easy. This is something we have to practice. This is something we have to go through. And uh, it, it starts with feelings. So if this is to Southern California for you, Sorry, people have feelings. Your patients are people. Okay, so we got to tap into the psychological piece, the emotional piece, and the spiritual piece if need be as well. Because people will not change if you make them feel bad, scared, ashamed, or humiliated. But if you are compassionate, if you are empathetic, and you care for them from your heart, not just from your mind, they'll do something about it. And it, it starts with something called reframe or reframing. And, um, you know, we talk a lot about mindset. I've learned so much from Ryan Holiday about mindset. But I think a lot of this now has to transfer from changing the patient's mind to changing the patient's feelings. And forgive me, um, I've been giving you information, if you've seen me lecture before, a lot about the negativity and the fear of dying. Now that I've read this research, I'm like, holy cow. I'm way off. I've been teaching, hey, problem, consequence, comorbidities, scare the pants off of them, and then maybe they'll listen to you about sleep and airway issues. But there's something to be said about moving from the fear of death to the, to the joy of living. And last year, uh, I had the honor to, to share a little bit about future possibility. And, and you really have to paint a picture for this patient of what the, the future looks like if I take a sleep test, if I'm in therapy, a follow-up care, working alongside my physician, treating my diabetes, finding all these other things out. And you can do that through motivational interviewing. Not easy, but you can do it. So speaking of motivation, anybody ever seen this before? Come on, you know, you're being shy, but they only have these out by us. Raise your hand if you've seen this before. I guarantee you all men, okay, a little secret here, okay. Ladies, forgive me, but motivation can happen in any way, shape, or form, and a, a lot of men need it. So, pretty, pretty fascinating. They put these things in the middle of a urinal for men who can't shoot straight. And doing the research on this is pretty funny. There are actually a lot of different kinds you can do. Um, and I, I asked my wife if we could, you know, maybe do a Target or uh, what have you. She's like, no, then it's going to look like something's dirty in the toilet. I'm like, our son, I wake up every morning and it's like everywhere. I can't figure it out at six years old. Here's the deal. No person is completely unmotivated, but you have to tap into that with their feelings. And without it, it doesn't work. So motivational interviewing, I'm going to give you a briefing on it. 
If anyone wants to dive into this with me deeper, personally, one-on-one with your practice via webinar, I'm happy to do it. But this is what it boils down to. It is a partnership built around compassion where we're evoking or we are eliciting acceptance from that patient. But it's, it's through the patient, okay? We're not, we're not demanding things. And I, I do believe there's a sense of authority that you have to have because you are the doctor. You need to tell them what's up and you need to inform them in a certain way. But that doesn't work for everybody. So do this without judgment. And you're trying to elicit something called change talk. Okay, change talk is, these are buying signs. This is, yeah, you know, I might, I might do that or I'll try to. I, I promise I'll, you know, I'll consider that. That's what you're trying to elicit from these patients by asking them the proper questions. And so it's the darndest thing to do. Um, it's not easy. I try to use it on my children. Um, I'll show you how that works in a second. But darn could be a good thing. So you might want to write this one down. So darn, as you look at it in motivational interviewing, is tapping into the patient's desire. And what is their, what is their ability? Because if they don't have the ability to do this, they're out. If they don't have the desire to do this, they're out. What are the reasons that are going to support it? And then finally, what is the need behind it? So... Darn can be a good thing. But without all those, we're stuck telling the patients why you need a sleep test, why you need to change your sleep habits, why sleep therapy is important, why you need to change. When I already don't want to change, I'd rather die. So try asking these questions that allow patients to tell you why they should change their sleep habits. Allow patients to tell you why they need to take that sleep test or why they need to change. And friends, I think it's in the handout too, but if you email me, I'm happy to share because I want to be courteous of our other folks. We've just got a few minutes left. Okay, so try this out. And this works on your kids if you can't get them to do your homework, their homework. Okay, so watch this. On a scale of one to 10, how important is is it to you to sleep well? You say seven, sitting in your dental chair. Okay, Okay, seven, that's all right. Take it from there. Why are you at a seven and not lower? You're probably thinking I was going to say higher, but why, right? It's like, that doesn't make any sense, right? Hang on, this is tricky. So why are you at a seven and not lower? Think about how I I would respond to that. I would say, well, you know, I want to wake up feeling good. I used to go to the gym at 6 a.m. every morning. Um, I want to play with my kids in the afternoon. I don't want to fall asleep before my wife does because she always gets mad at me for that. Do you hear what I'm saying? I'm saying all the reasons that you want to tell me, but instead I as the patient am saying it for you. Then from there, what might happen that could move you from a seven, just to maybe just two numbers higher or one number higher? What might happen? Well, Doc, you know, I'll, I'll take that brochure you were showing me about sleep and airway. Thank you. Um, you know, I might consider that CBCT scan thing. That looked really cool, and then maybe I can physically see it for myself. And, and maybe I'll do that sleep test, or, you know, Steve, maybe you can, I'll go to that physician you want to refer me to down the street. Um, so, again, they are telling you what you want to hear, and it's a simple question. So how confident are you that you could move from a 7 to a 9? Oh, I could do that. 7 to 9, no big deal. Okay, well, Mr. Patient, how can I help you get there? Uh, well, you said something about the CBCT scan, but maybe I would take the next step and, and do that sleep test. Um, where do I get the information for that? So what you just did is you elicit, elicited the answers that you want by not telling, by not asking them directly, and they're very open-ended. Okay? So you could do that with your kids. I'm not going to go through it now just because of time. So three things that we've got to focus on. Asking, listening, and informing. And... Since it's Valentine's Day, why not talk about a bouquet? So as I'm going through a meadow, I'm grabbing one flower here, one flower here, picking up another one here, and I'd give them to my wife if she was here, but I'll give them to you. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm asking questions, I'm gaining feedback. I'm reflecting, I'm gaining feedback, I'm asking questions, I'm moving forward. And so asking is really important, but you've got to do it well. Um, interrogating patients don't, it just doesn't work well. So in asking, you've got to stay curious. You've got to stay present. Be there with the patient. Don't let them think that you're running behind. 
Every time I went to see my sports medicine doc after surgery, and I knew him from the gym already, always late and always in a hurry. I'm like, Mike, dude, just spend two seconds with me. I'm telling you, this is what's going on. But I'm too nice, so I didn't say any of that. Um, and, and here are some things to be cautious about, right? Tone, pacing, wording, clarity. I've got to think about all those same things here, too. And no serial investigation. I'll tell you why. My wife hates that. If I ask one question, I don't let her answer. Maybe it's better that she's not here, because then I can talk about her. Don't tell her. Oh, she's probably going to see the video. Anyways, if I ask, she knows. I ask her one question, I don't let her answer because she's not responding as quickly I would, as I would have responded. It's like, Ryan, just let me finish. Or if it's like, boom, 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 boom. Your patients then step back from you. They're not open. They're not honest. Again, I don't want to break anything, but I tend to move around a lot. So take that into consideration. Listening, something us men are real good at, right? I want to read this to you guys so you get it. Being heard and understood... As the focus of compassionate attention is healing in itself. I'll say it again. Being heard and understood as the focus of compassionate attention is healing in itself. But we're too busy trying to get to the next patient. We see it. I see it when I'm at my dental office, surgeon, primary care, you name it. So something to think about in the research. Patients who are provided more listening, more uh, attentive listening. They're more comfortable. They're more satisfied. They trust you, and they will accept your advice. And believe it or not, it will save you time if you just shut up and listen, and it will make the patient feel like you've given more time to them as well. And, you know, you ask, but shut up. I'm terrible at this. I'm working on it. We're in this together. So asking is not listening. You ask, you still have to listen. Three, informing. We all do this in different ways, right? I like to think dentists are better at this than most, and this is why we hang out in the dental space. You guys are a lot nicer. Um, but people are different. We're all different. We want something different. Some of us want it honest and direct. Some of us want it gentle and sugar-coated because we're afraid of the outcome. Have you ever thought about the fact that you're physically showing a diagnosis of a life-threatening disease with sleep apnea? Flip it, put yourself in their shoes. Know who that person is and ask permission before you inform. When you ask permission, and may I please give you some advice on this, you get down to their level and you're, you're connecting with someone as a person and not just a patient. And then you inform, but the patient makes choices. So whether you give them two or three choices, that's up to you. I'm a big advocate of saying, Mr. Patient, I can refer you for a home sleep test or I can refer you for a polysomnograph. Here's what this looks like. Here's what this is like. What do you think is best for you? What's most important to you about that process? Quick, easy, efficient, in your own bed, or more detailed data. When they choose, they've got skin in the game, and you just co-created what they're going to do next. Appliance therapy. I know a lot of you all do this too. Do you want to work with some kind of oral appliance? Here are the four or five different uh, pieces that we have. Or one of the physicians I work with down the road will supply some form of pap therapy. Let them be involved in the conversation. Let them co-create the opportunity with you. And finally, set great expectations. This goes for anybody and everybody. I don't care who you are. Uh, our business, it's very important to do. If they walk out of your door with poor expectations and don't know what to do next, you're in trouble. Because a patient who's uninformed, who's concerned, who's scared, they have anxiety. They do nothing. So think about that. And before I do uh, a quick closing comment, if I could, I ask you for one small favor. Did any of this resonate with you? Does it make sense? So is it worth asking for a favor? Since my wife's not here, will you guys just say with me, happy Valentine's Day, Selena? We'll see how we can do this. And then I've got two closing comments and we're out of here. So I'm going to say on three, we'll just say one, two, three, happy Valentine's Day, Selena. Cool? Ready? One, two, three. Happy Valentine's Day, Selena. Love you, babe. Happy Valentine's Day. All right, closing comments. Here's the deal. Awareness is a choice. 
whether you think it's weird or not, it starts with you. Okay, remember, people would rather die than change. You've got to motivate the patients, starting with their behavior first. And then finally, if you do all these things and you just be a part of this, um, I'm quite confident that everybody in this room can be a part of having a positive impact on what the CDC calls an epidemic. So thank you all very much. Appreciate you. DS3, thank you. It's an honor. I don't know if we have time for questions. That's up to you guys. Two questions? Sure, I'll take them. Or you can come see me over at the booth. Whatever. No questions? Okay, we're going to take... Thank you, Ryan. One more time for Thanks, Ryan. Guys. Thank you.